um, pray because I think this is um, this is a study that I think is very important. Uh, I think everything that is in the word. Twenty-five people, the most ever. Don't know who that was, but hello. So, um, I think the study for the study of the next over the next few weeks will be it. it I'm going to try and balance it between theory and practical, because at the end of the day, what matters is is um, not just that we know what the Bible says, but that we actually do it, um, and that it 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 flows down to our our lives. So, I started this um, study on 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 something that can change our 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 lives or our outlook. And then went to go look at the Bible. What does the Bible say about it? And I just want to share that with you. So the, the title of the whole study is, Can God Use Me for the Greatest Miracle? And um, as, as we progress tonight, you'll know why I'm asking that question. And uh, specifically for tonight, um, the topic is, What Makes Heaven Happy? Uh, this is something that I'm sure you've picked up when Brian is very passionate about. Many people that I know on this uh, group is passionate about this. Um, and they are so excited about that. Um, I saw uh, Philip and them on just now. I think so somewhere. Um, just want yeah, to ask, yeah, hello. Philip, how's it, brother? Um, would you mind closing in prayer for us at the end? No problem. Thank you. So welcome to everybody. Um, just want to say, uh, those of you who do join this study on Wednesdays, you know how it goes. Uh, communication is open. You'd like to add something, ask something, correct something, uh, just do so. Just unmute yourself and, you know, just shout. Um, I'm going to mention some scriptures. So if you do have a pen with you, welcome to write it down. We're not going to go to every verse. Um, and I'm going to probably look at about three texts that you can turn there with me. So if you've got your Bible, then you can turn with me to those texts. Um, and then I'll also... Just now and then ask a question and your feedback or input will be great. All right, can we go? Sure, go for it. Sweet. All right. So the, the, the question I want to start with is what makes heaven happy? And, um, and the reason why I asked that question is because I think whatever makes heaven happy is important, right? So those of you married you you got to figure out what makes your wife happy then you've got a happy life right uh when you were a kid you knew what your parents what made them happy and you made sure that you did that which made your parents happy well most of the time and i, I think similarly spiritually um if we know what makes heaven happy that um that will affect i think what we do so i think we okay. all would love to know what's happening in heaven um i think it, it must be glorious what's happening there um paul quotes isaiah 64 verse 4 in first corinthians 2 verse 9 and i'm going to use it slightly out of context but it's such a good explanation of what i think is going on in heaven um he says no eye has seen no ear has heard no mind has conceived what god has prepared for those who love him in other words you can't see anything on the earth today that is as good as what is in heaven. You can't, nobody can explain to you with words how awesome it is, whatever it is. And our brains are too small to comprehend, uh, even if it could be revealed to us. Um, does anybody know of anybody else who went into heaven and came back in the New Testament? Paul, Paul, yes, Paul, and Dorcas, Dorcas, okay, great, thanks, thanks for that, I'm just going to refer to Paul, because Paul spoke about it, he said that in, 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 in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4, he said, when, when he was in paradise, he heard, or the third heaven, he heard things that man is not permitted to talk about, so uh, it's still very mysterious, but it seems like it seems like angels are happy there. Whenever we read about yeah. angels in heaven, it seems like 
they're happy. They're singing, they're praising. Um, they glorify God, not because they're told to do so, but because it's the only it's the only appropriate response to what they're seeing and experiencing. It's like, you know, like we've said before, I mean, you know, I've, I've always said, I don't want to go to heaven if I'm going to sing there the whole day because I'm horrible at singing, you know, but that seems to be what we're going to do there. And I don't think it's, it's going to be like we get to heaven and God says, okay, guys, now we're going to sing for eternity. I think it's more, it's going to be the appropriate, the only appropriate response, whatever we're going to see and experience and witnessing God is going to be so mind blowing. The only thing that we're going to be able to do is say, wow, that's amazing. Well, wow, you are awesome. And, and, and I think that's what the angels are doing permanently glorifying um, God. Um, Isaiah also, he got a glimpse into heaven when uh, he, he saw this, this vision of God sitting on, 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 a, on his throne and with the seraphim singing. And they sang, this is Isaiah 6, verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Um, so angels seem to be impressed by who God is. That really impresses them. Um, but also I think they're impressed by what God does. So the scriptures show us that I could find at least three other places in the Bible where we are told what makes angels rejoice. Um, that's outside of heaven. So if they're not rejoicing because of God, three other places that I could find where angels sang and praised. The first is when God created the world. Um, Isaiah of Job 38 verse 7 says that the angels were singing for joy while God was creating the world. So that tells us a few things. It tells us that it was amazing when God spoke the world into existence and the angels thought, well, that's, that's really cool. And it also tells us that angels were created before the world was created. And I'll say a little bit more on that just now. The second time that we also read about angels singing and praising on earth was when Jesus was born or just, yeah, in Luke 2, verse 13 to 14, this whole choir from heaven uh, meets the shepherds in the field and sing praises to God because of the Messiah is coming and that he's going to pay for the sins of the, the people of the world. And then there's a third occasion, and I'd like you to read this with me. This is in Luke chapter 15. If you got your Bible with you, please uh, turn this along. I'll give you a few seconds for that. And this isn't, this wasn't a once-off event. This is not a, this is something that happens continuously. This is something that happens often. Luke 15 and we'll read verse 7 and 10, I think it is. Um so for those of you who don't know, Luke chapter 15 is the, is the, is the, is the great chapter of the lost. Um, Jesus teaches us about the lost coin, about the lost sheep, and the lost son. And, and then in verse 7, he says, now I want us to read this. And if you'd like to make a comment, I'd really like to ask you, what do you think about this verse? What comes up in your mind if anybody would like to give comments? But... Verse 7 says the following. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. We know this verse is important because in verse 10, he sort of repeats it. And he says, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So anybody that would like to add, what comes up in your mind when you hear that or read that? Anything that stands out for you or you'd like to share with us? Going going gone okay so what stands out for me in verse 7 is that he makes a comparison 
between 99 righteous persons and one person that is lost. And he says that heaven rejoices more over that one lost sheep that repents than about the 99 people that don't need to repent. And I think we could we could sort of draw a comparison also to the story of the of the prodigal son. I mean, um, in a sense, it's like these 99 sheep could be the church. And heaven doesn't rejoice in the same way about the church, all the people in the church, compared to that one person who repents and turns back to God. Um, we then read further about the prodigal son, how God demonstrates his feelings um, about how souls return to him like the prodigal son. Um, and when his lost son returned, he started a feast with everyone in his household. So it's a, it's a perfect illustration of what happens. If you, if you look at this father making a feast for his lost son, um, I mean, it's a perfect illustration about how God feels when a sinner turns to him. At that stage, um, and, and on the moment, they were fraught with nerves. They were about to meet the world's press, all the paparazzi and the I think that's a news channel there. Um, Helen Evans. <laughs> I remember William having his hand. So, when Jesus said these things, when he spoke about angels rejoicing when sinners repent, he was speaking from experience. Remember, he came from heaven. So, he's seen how this works in heaven. He's seen how this, how heaven erupts. Viewing what happens on the earth, seeing how that changes heaven. He's seen that firsthand. Um, so, so far we can see Angels rejoice in the world <laughs> created. And that must have been absolutely phenomenal. But the world will not be um, created again. Okay, it's happened once. We're not talking about a new heaven and earth. So that type of rejoicing will not happen again. And the second is the birth of the Messiah. Well, the Messiah has already come. So heaven won't rejoice about that again. Maybe with the second coming. Um, and then... Heaven rejoices permanently in the presence of God because of his glory and his majesty and his holiness and his and, and the amazing sacrifice that he made for the human race. So that happens permanently. The only thing left outside of heaven, the only thing that we could do to make heaven rejoice again is by helping people meet Christ, come to repentance and turn to God. So then the question is, why does heaven make such a big fuss about lost souls? I'm giving that over to you guys. Anybody that's not shy. Why does heaven make a big fuss about souls repenting? Why is that the most important, the most exciting thing that happens? Um, I, feel, I think God wants everybody to be saved. So he doesn't want one single soul to to not be saved. So that's why heaven will rejoice for that one person that repents. Yes, dear Walt, and that you actually quoted a scripture. I think it's uh, 1 Timothy 2, 4. God wants all men to be saved. Thanks, dear Walt. Michiel, it's, it's, it's the reason why God created everything. He wanted, he wanted to populate heaven. And then at the fall, the population dramatically decreased. And so with each repentant soul getting back into the kingdom of heaven, it was God's uh, original purpose, original reason for creating everything, to share in his glory, to share in his, in his home. And uh, when one repents, that just adds to the citizenship of the kingdom. Absolutely. Wow. And that's, that's powerfully said, 100%. Anybody else? All right. So, um, one thing that, that stand out for me is, um, and that ties into with what both Diewald and, and Philip had said, is that when a person repents and finds Christ, eternity changes. I mean, um, 
when a disciple is made, eternity is altered. Forever there will be an extra person, an extra seat in heaven. Forever. Forever a, a place out of hell is, is taken away. So it's a big deal. Um, when, so when we make disciples, we are literally impacting eternity. I remember this guy say once, and, and I've mentioned it to you before. It, it, this guy said, if you, if you want to make an impact for 100 years, then you, you become a teacher. If you want to make an impact for, um, for 1,000 years, you become a sage. You want to make an impact for, for, for eternity, save a soul. And so that's really something that we could do, that we could participate in, that doesn't just impact 100 years or 1,000 years, but impacts all of eternity. So heaven doesn't really seem to rejoice um, when I get a new car, which hasn't happened, I think, ever. It doesn't really, heaven doesn't really rejoice when I get a degree or I get a promotion at work or I hit this massive business deal or I get to eat some ice cream at the beach on a very hot day. That doesn't seem to be the stuff that heaven really erupts about. And although I am sure that heaven is quite impressed with this, um, with, with Bible reading and with church attendance and prayer and, and giving to poor people, I think that impresses heaven and makes God's heart warm. Um, the Bible nowhere says that heaven erupts in joy because of those things. Um, in the same way as a sinner who repents activates the praise of heaven. Those things just don't measure up. Um, so I want us to read a text quickly. It's in John chapter 14. And this is the, the key text at the heart of this whole series of studies for this term or how long it ever it, it takes or how many Wednesdays we've got. John chapter 14, verse 8 to 14. Jesus is having a conversation here with Philip. Philip, Philip Thrawn, you, you are biblical, brother. <laughs> the closest name I got in the Bible to my name is Michal, and she was a woman. So, it's embarrassing. <laughs> so, verse 8. Uh, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So I'm just going to pause there for a moment. And then sort of just explain that again. So, so Jesus is essentially saying to Philip, look, if you are struggling to believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, that I'm the exact representation of the Father, if you're struggling with that, if you're struggling to come to grips with the fact that you're seeing God in flesh in front of you, I mean, just believe in the miracles. Uh, Jesus had performed many miracles in front of his disciples, right? So just a quick question. What do you guys think is the biggest miracle that Jesus ever did? Any miracle that comes up in your mind that you think that was huge. He stood up from the grave. Oh. He stood up from the grave. Okay, that's the biggest miracle ever. Okay, anything else? Raised Lazarus from the dead. Okay. You raised Lazarus from the dead. Yes. He healed blind people. Healed lepers. He healed lepers, which was a disease that only God could heal. Um, he healed the lame. One. Sorry. Turn water into wine. Yeah, you could walk on water. Is that? And turn water into wine. 
Yeah. Denise says he took our sins away. Yeah, that is the, the, the big thing. So, okay. So if we, if we look at Jesus and his statement here, he's saying that we can do greater things than he did. That's what he says in verse 12. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. What, is, what could we possibly do that is greater than what Jesus did? I mean, I've never met anybody that can walk on water. I've never met anybody that can raise the dead. I know there's a guy in Joburg who claimed to raise somebody from the dead recently. Not real. We get people to, we, well, to repent. Because we don't convert anybody. God does. Right. Remember, when Jesus said this, it's before he died on the cross. At that point in time, it, it it wasn't possible to be reconciled with God, to experience the forgiveness of sins. And that's what Jesus didn't and, and couldn't do at that time. Yes, at his resurrection, he provided the means for that. But after Jesus died on the cross, so, so the only thing greater than raising somebody physically from the dead is raising somebody spiritually from the dead. The greatest miracle of all time is God forgiving a sinner. Somebody paying for the sins of sinful people. And the sad thing about this, you know, that, that we see so often in our world, it's like the Pentecostal movement. I mean, they have these huge crusades and they have healing services and people go there to get healed. They want their limbs to grow back and their... Um, the eyes to see, the blind to have the eyes see, etc. And the main thing is made physical healing. Yet the main thing is not spiritual healing, and that's exactly what the world needs. Uh, so that's that's sad, you know. So so heaven doesn't clap hands when the cripple walk again. Um, heaven claps hands when souls repent, like we've said. And the sad thing is this, is that we humans, we, we tend to emphasize physical healing more than spiritual healing. Um, you know, we've got um, some people that we know who are baptized people and Christians. And when we baptize people at, that, at our house, and they live very close by and they know the baptisms are happening. They, they're just indifferent. They don't really care. They don't really want to be here. And so, so they, never, they never come when that happens. And that, that sort of hurts. And it sort of gives an indication that it's not, they don't realize what is taking place in heaven in moments when people actually get baptized. And they, they make this commitment to God and, and get rid of their sin. So it seems like generally people are much more concerned about physical things than about spiritual things. Things. And so Jesus is saying here that those who follow me will do even greater things than I've done. It's not referring to the miracles because nobody can do greater miracles than Jesus did. It's genuinely referring to reaching the lost world. You must remember, Jesus never really traveled far when he was on earth. Yet when he died, the message of the cross spread out all over the world. Jesus had about 120 people following him by the time of his crucifixion. Within 40 days from there, within, within 50 days from there, there were 3,000 people believing in his name. So the apostles and the, the disciples, they managed to gather a greater crowd than Jesus could while he was alive. And we are part of that whole process because we're continuing with the book of Acts. So we are rewriting the book of Acts. And I, I think sometimes we have stopped writing Acts and started to sit and wait for Jesus to come back. And just one last section before I do a summary and, and sort of a conclusion and get some thoughts from you is, is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I know there's some young people on the, the call as well. I'd like to challenge them and ask them if they do know what the Ark of the Covenant is and if they could explain what it looks like. Anybody? 
the Ark of the Covenant. It's a wooden box um, with uh, that's gilded, and in the lid of the box is pure gold, and then there's two angels looking down with the wings spread out on top of the mercy seat. Perfect. Wow, dude. Well done, man. That's a perfect illustration. Um, I've got I've got an image for you, but uh, yeah. I'm not gonna share it because I don't want to mess up the study. That's perfect. So, so it's this golden. It's it's a it's a box made, I think, of acacia wood, and it's covered in gold. And yes, and then this golden tablet, which they call the mercy seat, and then on top of it, you've got the two cherubim. And those of you who don't know that the seraphim are sort of the worshiping angels with God the whole time, and the cherubim are the warrior angels. So there's two cherubim on top of this mercy seat, and every year on the um, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in to the, the holy place where this ark is, and he would pour the blood of a lamb without spot or blemish onto the mercy seat. And that, that would cover the sins of the people or push forward the sins of the people in the case of the Jewish race. So Moses told God to make that box specifically like that, um, sp specifications to the T, because it's a foreshadow of a greater reality in in heaven um, so it carries great symbolism these angels are looking down onto the blood that's being poured out for the people now i believe that this is referred to in the new testament in first peter 1 of 12 where peter writes to these christians scattered throughout the pagan the pagan world and he says to them listen listen you guys you know what the Holy Scriptures prophesied about you guys, that you guys would receive salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 12, B, he says, even angels long to look into these things. So I'm going to explain that in a moment, but I don't know how you guys understand angels, but the way that I make sense of it when I read the Bible is that so I asked the question, why do angels exist? And, and the book of Hebrews says that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who belong to, to God. So it seems like an angel is a being that God created that's capable of entering his holiness and entering our sinfulness. Because angels meet with God and angels meet with people or move around on the earth as, as we pick up. And so... They, they must be wonderful beings and they must have a tremendous perspective that you and I don't have because they see God's holiness. They see that he, they see his untouchable light. And yet they also see what we do. They see our murder. They see our rape. They see our lies and our deceit. And I think they wonder how such a holy God can be concerned about such a sinful race, sinful people. So these angels were, as we read in Job 38, we didn't read it, I referred to it. In Job 38, it says that the angels were singing for joy while God was creating the world. I think they knew something was up because they could see, as we read in Genesis, that God spoke the world into existence. So he spoke the planet and he, and he spoke animals and he spoke plants into existence. But when it came to creating human beings, he didn't speak them into existence he left his throne and he went and he, he came and he sat in the dust of earth and he formed man with his hands so the angels witnessed this and i reckon they they knew then something was up they knew then okay these 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 guys are special and similarly um this idea of the ark and the Angels looking down on the blood symbolizes the fact that the angels are looking at the sacrifice of Christ and they marvel at what's happening and they're struggling to understand and comprehend how such a holy God can be so merciful and so gracious and so loving and so forgiving. 
that this God, this magnificent God would allow us into heaven. And that is why I believe that angels erupt in joy when sinful people come in contact with the blood of Christ and they reconciled with the God of heaven. And I know that's, that's loaded, a lot of stuff to talk about there, but I think that's, the, that's what really matters. What really matters is what happened on the cross. And, and you know, the cross is really just a, a sermon of God, it's a proclamation of God saying, look, uh, this is how I feel about the human race. So let me summarize everything said, and then I'd like us to have a, just a chat, and then we, we're going to close off. So what has been said? Uh, nothing makes heaven happier than the repentance of a soul. And if we are citizens of heaven, I think it needs to be our first priority as disciples of Jesus to reach the lost. Secondly, angels are blown away by the fact that God forgives. Uh, and sometimes I think they struggle to understand why we don't feel the same about souls who repent. Thirdly, Jesus said that we could participate in the most amazing and powerful miracle on earth. The salvation of a soul. Now, we are not the people who makes the salvation possible, but God wants to use us in the process of connecting a lost person with us. God chose to, to use the proclamation of the gospel. He chose to use living human beings to tell the world about him. He could have done it another way. He could have written the gospel on rocks in the mountains. He could have written it in the skies. He chose living human beings to share his gospel message with the world. And that is exciting that God is saying, look, I want to use you to participate in the greatest miracle that could ever happen. I want to use you. That's exciting. And God wants us to use us to reach lost people. So, yes, the study and the series of studies is about making disciples. It is about evangelism. Now, I want you to pause for a moment. And be honest, for those of you who are, who are okay to be honest, and I'll be honest as well. When you hear the word evangelism, what goes on in your mind? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? What do you see when you hear the word evangelism? Somebody knocking on a door. <laughs> Absolutely. Was that uh, um, Spencer? Spencer. Yes. Uh, Sandra says, share the gospel. Yes, absolutely. So, anybody else? Jehovah's Cody. Witness. Sorry, Mike. Jehovah's Witness? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you guys are all reading my mind here. Yeah. Okay, just, okay. Just, is anybody excited? Like, is anybody excited about what Spencer said? Anybody keen on Saturday morning? We meet there in Westville. We'll meet at Grant's house. We're going to knock on a few doors. Who's excited about that? Spencer. <laughs> anybody, anybody recently had a, had a Jehovah's Witness at their door? There's a, there's a meme going around about Jehovah's Witness training camp. It's like this wall filled with doors. That's a training game. All right. So, a few years ago, I went door knocking with the church in Benoni. It was not an easy thing to do. What was difficult, Auntie Pat? It, just the way people saw you coming there. You know, they, their first thought, of course, is that you're Jehovah's Witnesses, and you've got to get past that before anything else. And then, then you've got to get past the fence, the electric fence. You've got to get yeah. past the pit bull. 
actually, this was a long time ago, and I was a very new Christian, so it was very new to me, all of that. So that's what made it also difficult for me, because I oh. felt like I didn't know what I was talking about. Ah. Oh. So just had a message there from Sandra. She's uh, living in South Africa, but from Argentina, and she says that uh, in Argentina, if you're not a Catholic, then you are considered like a Jehovah's Witness evangelist type of deal. So, okay. So nobody's had a Jehovah's Witness recently or a Mormon knock on your door. Okay. Young so, elders. Young elders, 18-year-old elders. Yes. That's right. <laughs> so so this, to be honest with you, this is, this is and I, I love it that, that everybody's honest here because when we, it, this word evangelism, I don't like that word, to be honest, it, because it's it just reeks of awkwardness because I'm thinking about the Jehovah's Witnesses. When, that, when I see them coming towards my house, which haven't happened recently, but you almost want to, I don't know, you, you, you just want to ignore them because there's something really awkward about it because it's, um, it's not natural, it's clinical, the person doesn't know you, and especially, and, and it might work, their methodology might work in the townships. I remember a few years ago, we went to, when I was at SAVS, sorry, 15 years ago, we went to um, um, Venda, and we went, and when you arrive at the house, and everybody invites you in, and they give you oranges to eat, and they're so excited, they call the whole family to sit and listen to you, that's a different story, I mean, it doesn't happen generally, um, I think we, yeah, so, Marie, yeah, thank you very much, Marie just sent a message, you know, it feels like a salesman approaching you, it's like this person's trying to sell something to you. Um, so we feel uncomfortable with it uh, when the Jehovah's Witnesses come and they knock on the door. Um, I've done door knocking in, in sort of uh, middle class areas and uh, it's generally very awkward. People don't really want to talk to you. Been involved with gospel crusades where you have this big tent, you invite people to come. You send a flyer in the post or whatever, newspaper article, or you, you make an advertisement at the radio, and people generally don't rock up to strange meetings that they don't know the people of. Um, I also think of guys like Billy Graham and Angus Buchan. You know, you look at these guys, and, and you know, uh, I mean, Billy Graham preached once, uh, and I think it was in Germany, and a third of the people repented that night. There's 40,000 people that came to the stage when he said, look, uh, let's make an altar call deal. Now, I don't know whether baptism happened there or what, but in case, I mean, so I think about those guys when I hear the word evangelism. In one night, they can, like, get 40,000 people to turn to God. Um, and also, I agree with Marie, you know, I, I think about telemarketers. I don't know, anybody recently had one of those calls? Is anybody anybody on this on this this call? Um, do you actually enjoy talking to telemarketers? Anybody? Yeah. Who's got the best excuse? I've got it. I've been there. I'm not interested. I have no more money. COVID killed me. <laughs> COVID killed me. <laughs> <laughs> The thing is, they're getting good. They will continue. They, they will say, no, don't worry, don't worry. And they will have another thing to say unless you cut off the phone. So, yeah, and that's that's what you feel like because you don't want to evangelize because then you feel like you're the telemarketer. You're actually annoying people. They don't want to hear about it. Um, so I think we are all sort of on the same page by the way that I'm listening to things. And by the way, no offense to anybody that is a telemarketer in the study. We love you. Just don't call, please. <laughs> so so when we, when we look at all of, when we look at Jehovah's Witnesses, we look at door knocking, we look at cold calls. I mean, no wonder it's something that we don't want to do and something that we don't feel comfortable with. And when we look at, you know, Maybe if you've got a personality, like this heavy outgoing personality, it's no problem for you to be awkward or to feel embarrassed. Maybe some people have that personality, but certainly we don't all have that. I definitely don't have that. Um, not all of us are Billy Grahams. We have an opportunity to preach to 120,000 people. 
Not all of us are Angus Buchans. And so what we tend to do is, we tend to say, okay, but look, the preacher of the church, he's the evangelist, so he must reach the lost. Um, because that's his gift. Does anybody know what the problem is with that? Anybody wants to give a shot? What's the problem with that? So the preacher is generally preaching to the saved already. Okay, yes. Thank you. Yeah. It's also not a biblical pattern. Cool, yeah. So the preacher is so busy with the congregation, when is he going to find the time to go and evangelize? Yes. Jesus, Jesus says, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, that takes time. It doesn't happen in one night. Yes, so making disciples is not just about saying, hey, obey the gospel, get baptized, and cheers, bro. Right. No. Yes. The key, the key I'd like to share, everything is true, but the key that I'd like to say just tonight is this. There, there are people in your life that you can connect with in a way that nobody else can, not even the preacher. There's family members that, that you have. There's friends that you have. There's neighbors that you have. There's people that you work with. That the preacher doesn't even know. He doesn't even come into contact with him. Now I know. I've, I've been preacher for a long time. And you know sometimes people dump me. Onto people. And I could sense the awkwardness. But if that person could just. Love their neighbor or their friend. Whoever that is. And grow so that they could actually. Teach that person the gospel. I mean. the Durban would be turned around. If each one of us. We don't need to be awkward. We just connect with the people that's already in our lives, that respect us, that we've got contact with, that got, we've got a relationship with. If we just make ourselves available to God in that process, yeah, Durban can be turned around like this. If every Christian in Durban just did that. And we're going to see in the upcoming studies how the first century church just did that. Because in Jerusalem, the elders stayed behind and the rest of the church scattered throughout the world. And within 30 years, Paul writes and he says, the whole known world had heard about Jesus. How did they do that? Well, they clearly didn't send the preachers to do that. Of course, the preachers got to do that. The elders got to do that. The deacons got to do that. Every disciple of Jesus needs to do that. Now, we, we, we don't all have the same gifting. It's like, you know, it's like some people have said to me, um, you know, a lady, the other said to me, so... What, what do you do? So I said, well, I make disciples. And she says, well, is that so? Oh, is that your, she's a Christian. Is that your thing? I'm, I'm, no, that's not my thing. That's Jesus' thing. And that's every disciple's thing supposed to be. Now, I might not be as good as it as Angus Bachan or whatever other guy. But that doesn't mean that I shouldn't be, be doing that or, or trying to do that. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't want me to participate in this great miracle that there might be somebody living right next to me that nobody on the earth can connect better with than me. So by me cutting myself off from that, I'm robbing myself of a wonderful opportunity to be used by God. And as we will see in future studies, that is just a wonderful, wonderful spiritual experience to lead somebody to Christ. Anybody else wants to um, mention something? Yeah, um, I'd like to say something. Um, I think we need to be in tune with the Holy Spirit and listen to him. And we don't like necessarily have to be proactive to go and make disciples. We'll be led by the Holy Spirit in certain situations. Um, short little testimony. It was two weeks ago. I went and got and picked up my son from his mom's house. Um, I'm on my way to church. And his stepdad invites me in for a drink. I'm like, no, I can't go and have a drink now with you before church. And when he insisted <laughs> the second time, I, I had this feeling like maybe there's something happening here. I need to go in. So I thought, cool, I've got like half an hour to spare. Let me quickly go in and see what you want to chat about. Three hours later, 
he wants now to get baptized. So I could have right there decided, no, I'm not going to go in. I'm on my way to church. But I, I just got, I just, I'm going to say it. I, I stilled my thoughts and I just had this feeling strong, very strong feeling that the Holy Spirit wanted me there in that spot. So basically what I want to say is that um, God will create opportunities for us to disciple. So, and we just need to listen and act on that. Dear Lord, thank you, Brew. That, that is absolutely awesome. And I, I, I think you're correct. And there's two things that you're touching on that we'll deal with in these studies, upcoming studies. There's different types of ways to reach people. And this is not my idea. This is actually in the Bible. And we're going we're gonna to look at that. And you can actually look at what the scripture says and then realize, well, this is actually the way that I'm good with it. That's the one thing. Um, some people are good with proactively reaching out to people. Some people are good with that. That's their talent. They need to do that. Um, but what I love about you saying is that you're saying you were open for God to use you. And you listen to his, his voice, his prompting. And I think we need to do more of that. The thing is just that sometimes it's not even on our radar because we are so preoccupied with all the other things in our lives. Awesome, dear Walt. Love it. Anybody else? All right. So what is this study going to be about? Because you guys are sitting here tonight and you're saying, okay, well, maybe I don't want to hear about evangelism or study this um you know i i grew up in the church of christ and i've heard hundreds of lessons about evangelism and generally those lessons are like this you need to do it that's it and uh yeah that didn't really inspire me to do it what this study is about is not that we all know that we've been called to make disciples the last words of Jesus on earth was not, uh, I don't know, start a Bible college, pray every day. Although those things are cool and good and Jesus did tell us to pray. He didn't say, know the Bible from front to back. No, he said, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as you said, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And here's the beautiful section. And he says, and behold, I'll be with you even until the end of the age. That is a beautiful promise. The last words of Jesus on earth, he's saying, I, ca I can't guarantee that I'm going to be with you if you do this or that. But I can guarantee you this. If you make disciples and that's your goal, then I will be with you. And the cool thing about what we're going to study is, we're going to study that it's actually not as awkward and threatening and weird to just be available to God to reach out to lost people and we're going to look at some practical things so um so I don't think that our problem with evangelism is that we don't know we should be doing it the problem is is that we don't know how to do it and that was revealed tonight because when I mentioned the word evangelism everybody thought the same way as I do I think we all think the same way like okay it means let's be awkward it means going to the mall and walking up to a random person saying, do you know Jesus? You know? And I'd like to suggest that's not actually what we read in the Bible. Um, so in the upcoming studies, I'd like to do the following. Excite us about reaching the lost. It's actually exciting. Take away the awkwardness of reaching the lost. Um, show from scripture how to reach the lost in a very powerful and non-threatening way. And lastly, show that all we need to do is to be open to the people um, in our sphere of influence that is very busy seeking him. Um, when Brian, I, I can't remember what we called it at the four fields. It, is it a map? Does family map or I can't remember. You know that network? You know the Oikos map, your family map, the home, yeah. Oikos map was, or the or, um, friendship map, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Perfect. And that's all that evangelism really is for most of us, is to reach people in our Oikos map. 
So the real goal that I hope to reach at the end of the study is for some of us to say, hey, I can do that. And I'm actually excited about it. That's that's the main goal. So 52 minutes past seven. Anybody with a last comment? And then I'm going to ask Philip to just pray for us. Comment, question, addition. Okay, Philip, will you pray for us, brother? Sure, thank you. Mighty Father, we uh, are grateful that we can be together and to hear this uh, uh, teaching from Michiel, a teaching that comes from your word, uh, reminding us of the importance that we have to share the gospel. Um, Father, it is so beautiful to hear and to know and to learn that uh, all of heaven rejoices when one uh, sinner repents. Uh, Father, we want to make uh, a resounding noise. We want to bring angels to a deafening sound uh, as we bring more sinners uh, to repentance. Father, we can all remember and recall the day that uh, we as sinners repented and we can recall the joy that we had and the, um, uh, the encouragement that we had that we had brought angels uh, into a singing chorus in heaven because of our obedience to the gospel. Father, we uh, oftentimes excuse ourselves or mitigate circumstances, uh, mute the promptings of the Holy Spirit to lead us to the next soul, to the next victory. But Father, we, we have all participated and been there and know uh, the times that we've responded and, and obeyed. Uh, and you've called into miraculous uh, sequence of events to bring another soul to you. And we're just so grateful that we could have participated in that. We're excited at this time, mm -hmm. Father, that you have people in mind as we're uh, studying this that need uh, that need our call, that need our visitation, that need our uh, uh, obedience to your prompting to bring them to an understanding uh, to, obey, to obey the gospel. And Father, that once again, we can bring uh, angels into a rejoicing chorus. Father, we're excited about this study. We're excited about what you've got planned for us through this and the celebrations that are going to take place as each one of us who's here present, Father, uh, is led closer to one more person that needs to hear what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We thank you for this time, Father. We, we know that there are many hardships and circumstances that some of us are going through. We just uh, extend our, our prayerful um, encouragement to all here present. But, Father, we have an opportunity uh, to, to make better this world, this city, and uh, Father, we just look forward to what we can learn and how we can implement these things. But most importantly, Father, that we'll be obedient and make ourselves available. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Machio. Good night. Have Amen. a great week. Guys. Thank you, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Bye. Machio. Bye. Thank you, Machio. Bye. 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 Thanks, Michiel. Bye. 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 B